drink your coffee and your water if you're carrying water. Um, I'd just like to ask if you can, can you please turn your, your cells on silent, it's just so that it doesn't interrupt the sound around us. And also, can I please have confirmation that everyone can knows that they will be in the pictures of the coffee talk today, so... <laughs> I see people are laughing. Is it okay? I don't want to I don't want any charges against me for using people's pictures inappropriately. So is it yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for your participation. All right. If you are seated in the audience, I hope you know why you're here. If you're invited by a friend, <laughs> that's also very good. But does anyone know why we're here today? Like, to those who are here for the very first time, by a show of hands, are there any people who are here for the first time? Oh, that's good. That's nice. Thank you. That means our marketing team is working very, very well. Thank you to everyone who's invited me first. So, for those who do not know why you're here, let's hope no one is sitting here doesn't know. But for those who don't know why you're here, this is the first time coffee talk that we, we have every last Tuesday of the month. Um, we usually choose um, a, a topic based on medicine, basically. So today's topic is glaucoma and we usually bring a guest, guest speaker and at the end of the session you guys usually ask questions. So you can only ask questions if you are actively listening during the session. So I'd also like to ask that you listen attentively and note all your questions down because I know sometimes you tend to forget. Note your questions down and then at the end of the session you go to ask questions. Are we good? We're good. Awesome. Why do you guys seem so uptight today? What's going on with those cowards? Can I get a few smiles? Thank you. At least now I feel more at home and relaxed. Alright, so like I mentioned, uh, we're talking about Glaucoma Awareness Month because we're in the month of March and we are joined by Dr. Anu van Anu Janssen van Rensburg. So we're about to tell you <laughs> I need to say a lot. Dr. Anu, can I just keep it Dr. Anu so that I don't twist my tongue a lot? Alright, so I'm just going to read you his bio, a very short bio, so that we are more familiar with him. He studied right here at the University of the Free State at this faculty, the Health Sciences, and he's traveled abroad as well as around the country for work purposes. So his area of expertise, which is ophthalmology, has taken him across the country and abroad. He has recently qualified as an ophthalmologist last year and he is now finishing in registrar time. So, um, I'd like us to please make him feel very, very welcome as we always do with our guests. Can we please give a round of applause for Dr. Adam? Hi Dr. Arno, how are you? It will be on now. Um, okay, before we, yeah, before we go on with it and while they're still working around. <laughs> Ophthalmology. Was there someone who introduced you to it? Was it because you had a keen interest in it as you were studying medicine? Why exactly? Thank you, Ruby, for the introduction. I didn't know while I was studying medicine that I would someday go into ophthalmology. I always knew that I would do something in the surgical fields um, and that that was something that I definitely knew, but it was only when I started shadowing other doctors in different specialities that I that I knew like this is going to be my passion. 
um, and I would really advise some of the students here to, if you don't know and you don't know what your passion is, to, to go and see what, what others do. Um, that you realize that I realized then you want some energy that you can do so much in so little time. And I mean, now cataract surgery takes 15 to 20 minutes and it makes such a huge, huge impact in people's lives and um, it gives me great satisfaction. And I will choose it all over again. Um, please be patient with us today, guys. Our mics? Yeah. Alright, so, um, considering that today's focus is on glaucoma, we're now going to get into the topic that we're talking about because it's Glaucoma Awareness Month. And I just want to see, though, in the audience first, by a show of hands, how many of you know what glaucoma is? Hmm, is that a good number or? Very good enough, but okay. All right, so I also want to remind you that the reason why we have these talks and invite a specialist um, is because we all need to be aware of what's going on, we all need to be educated, and I'd also like to encourage you that at the end of this talk, it is not just end here. It needs to go out there into the world, um, so your friends, your family, um, your peers, in, 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 in the lecture halls, continue the conversation even beyond this talk. Now, we're talking about glaucoma. What exactly is glaucoma, Dr. Kamen? So, glaucoma is an umbrella term for a group of conditions that affects the optic nerve. So, you can think of it, the eyeball is like a ball that is pumped up with fluid, and this fluid needs to drain out in order to, to keep the pressure at a certain level. If that pressure goes above the level of the patient, it damages the optic nerve, and the optic nerve you can think of as a cable from the eye to the brain. If that get damaged, it's irreversible, and it can lead to blindness. Um, you get different causes for, for glaucoma, um, so that's why we say it's an umbrella term, because there's, there's lots of causes for glaucoma. Um, but it's irreversible and it's something I'm, I'm very glad to see that there's people that, that heard the term before um, and not just in the movies. <laughs> and I love that you mentioned that, not just in the movies, because we get taught and fed a lot of false information. So it helps when we have someone who works with these things um, and operates and sees this and sees these cases um, from a first level point of view. Um, so what are the signs and the symptoms of glaucoma, if there are any, and is it preventable at all? So, there's a saying going around in the ophthalmology field, and maybe some of you have heard it, but it's called the silent thief in the night, because there's, there's no symptoms for glaucoma, usually, normally. Um, the patient can live with it for years, and only at its end and later stage that you realize he or she realized my vision is gone. Um, so it starts off by you missing objects and in, in your peripheral vision, um, and in the end you have this tunnel vision with only your central vision spare, and which is great because patients can live with central vision for a long period of time, but that's why you tend to miss it. You do, however, have symptoms of an acute form of glaucoma called angle closure glaucoma where the patient will present with a red, painful eye, seeing halos, have a headache, nausea and vomiting. But that's usually not the case. It's usually no symptoms and, and it comes on gradually over years. Um, is it preventable? You can prevent the damage, but once there is damage, it's irreversible. And that's the sadness of the disease. I was doing a bit of research on my own, um, just so that I don't come here and I seem like I know nothing. <laughs> and it seems in some way that it's also genetic. So would that mean then, if let's say for instance, uh, my mother or my father had it, are the chances higher of me also having it, or? 100%. Um, I wouldn't make the term say that it's always genetic. 
But if you have a first degree family relative, meaning your mother, father, that is known of glaucoma, you are at an increased risk of getting and developing glaucoma. Um, they say about eight to ten times the risk um, if you are known of a family member. So that's very, very important for, for those of you that want or thinking about getting screened, do I have glaucoma, I'm worried. If you are known of a family member with glaucoma, I would highly recommend going to your local ophthalmologist or optometrist just to get the, the baseline screening. I actually love that you placed the emphasis on getting screened, um, which we're still going to speak about closer to the end of the conversation. But I also want to know, once it's diagnosed, what treatment is there, is there made available? And are there any intense medical procedures that take place? Like I mentioned before, there's different kinds of glaucoma, but, but the most common cause of glaucoma is the primary open angle glaucoma, fancy word, but all that means is we can prevent the damage by there's three different forms of management at the moment, and we usually in our setting start off with topical treatment, meaning eye drops. Um, that is something a patient needs to take every day for the rest of his life. Um, we are striving towards going into more of the laser therapy of glaucoma to, to have that as our first slide. So you get, um, as mentioned in the opening statement, what is glaucoma? So it's actually the intraocular pressure or the pressure inside your eye that's causing the damage. So we are controlling the pressure in the eye by, by methods, different methods. So with the eye drops, there's different classes in that either decrease the pressure inside the eye by decreasing the fluid formation or by increasing the way the fluid is draining out. The second management option that we mentioned was laser therapy. It's also a way of getting rid of the fluid in the eye and make, make the draining process um, better. Um, the last option is surgery. It's usually for the advanced cases that we leave it in our setting, but, but sometimes we can start off with it um, depending on what type of glaucoma it is. So it depends on the type of glaucoma, then you know what you need to use. Okay. All right. Does it only affect the older generation, or are you seeing a pattern or trend in the younger generation as well? You are at an increased risk if you are above 60 years of age. Um, from 40 years onwards, your your chances of developing glaucoma increases. Um, it doesn't mean younger the younger age group can't get glaucoma. Like I mentioned, there's different types of glaucoma. In the younger population, it's usually due to trauma, or if they are known with a severe previous eye infection or severe inflammation, you are at an increased risk of developing glaucoma. But above 60 year old, it need, you need to go and get screened, if it, even if it's just once every second, third year. I was actually going to come to the screening question. Um, so how often then must a person go for screening? If you are above 60 years old and you are known with the risk factors that we've mentioned before, above 60 years of age, known with a family um, relative known with glaucoma, if you are on corticosteroids or somebody that's on steroids, somebody that's very near or far-sighted, um, and interestingly enough, African population is at, at an increased risk. If you're known of one of those risk factors, I would go to your ophthalmologist or opt optometrist just to get a screening, but from there we will guide you. If you are diagnosed with glaucoma, it will be every three to six months or yearly follow-ups. Um, if it's just for screening, I would recommend every second year from there if everything was fine on the first visit. And then, um, what are the after effects of your coma? If it isn't treated in time, can it lead to temporary or uh, can, can it lead to blindness actually? Because it can't be temporary, right? Yes, that's the sad truth. It, le um, it leads to permanent, irreversible blindness, and it's one of the leading causes of blindness, not just in developing countries but worldwide. Um, 
in fact, 67 million people worldwide living with glaucoma, and it's estimated to go up to 111 by 2040, according to studies. And then, is there an, is there an increase, though, even now, um, amongst, because I heard you mention amongst um, us as Africans, we're at a higher risk. Is there an increase at the moment? What are you seeing, like, in terms of what you see on a day-to-day? -day? So it is shown that the numbers of people living with glaucoma is increasing day by day. But that's due to the fact that, it's, that there's no symptoms, there's no signs. You don't know you are living with glaucoma. <coughs> So it's great to have talks like this so people can get awareness of what is glaucoma, should I get screened, to try and fight this disease, because it's 50% it's of people don't know they are living with glaucoma, and, and that's a fact, that's, that's quoted from studies, recent studies. Okay, all right, so, um, if that is then the case, then that brings me back to what I said earlier about the, the screening. Um, I have a problem, Dr. Irene, I don't know if it's just me or the audience will also, um, you know, agree to what I'm saying. But I feel like, especially with health and, you know, certain treatments that people get, other people, especially between public and private hospitals, you know, almost there's like that huge gap in between. So there are people who live in disadvantaged areas and they know nothing about glaucoma and all of that. What are what are you seeing ophthalmologists do now to further bring um, awareness to people? Is there is there any awareness that you know people are bringing um, around you, anything like that? Hundred percent. Um, there need to be more awareness. Um, going out, and I agree with you, there's sometimes not enough being done um, to, to, to get the awareness in the, in the community, but we do have certain outreach programs that we go out in the community with the sisters and, and we give educational talks. Um, we would operate on these patients and, and yes, take it further from there, but there's not enough being done. Um, glaucoma is not a term used in, in every household at the moment, and, and we should strive towards that. And we're definitely striving towards that by having you here, because um, obviously we're fighting against this one doctor at a time. Now, last and closing before I open to the floor for questions. What does a person who says, okay, now I've been diagnosed um, and I'm on my treatment lifestyle-wise, um, how can they improve their lifestyle? Is there anything that they should be doing, that they should be doing in order to also help the treatment work, if I can put it that way? So, once you're diagnosed, it would be to take your eye drops every single day for the rest of your life. If you are struggling with your eye drops, you get some help. If you are struggling with, for instance, a burning sensation because of the drops, mention that to your doctor and we can change it. The other do's and don'ts stays the same for every, anything in health is to eat healthy. They say green, leafy vegetables does pr um, promote eye health. Um, drink lots of fluid and exercise every day will come a long way. But to follow up regularly and to take your drops is probably the most important. And, and if something changes in your symptoms, don't wait. Rather attend and be um, reassured than sitting at home. Because once the damage has been done, it can't be reversed. Um, and with that, I'd also like to say that you also bring me to an important point. Um, and we mentioned it last time at the coffee talk about having regular checkups and screenings. I also want to emphasize this again for each and every one of us sitting here, which I think you most probably agree with, 
that it is important to have checkups with our doctors. As, as, as much as sometimes we want to know what's going on because we're so afraid of hearing bad news, but I think we're, based, we're both on the same page that we need to go for regular checkups. So I'd also like to encourage anyone in the room to go for the regular screenings, the checkups. If you are on medication, please continue with your medication. I know sometimes we tend to think that it will just go away. It's not going to go away. The medication is there for a reason. Dr. Yang, I'm going to open to the floor now for some questions. Um, I almost asked, are you ready? But I mean, you might as well be because <laughs> people have questions. Um, so how, are there any people in the audience with questions? I'm sorry how much time we have. Okay, so we're going to take a round of five questions. Is that good? Yes, okay. So, every population is, it's just how the eye is formed. Um, some eyeballs are longer, some are shorter to put it into layman terms, but it's just the way our Africans are, are, are made that, that we are at higher risk. Um, if you look at the anatomy and, and you look at the pressure, so we are worried about the intraocular pressure, the pressure inside the eye. And that pressure, need, that fluid that is making the pressure needs to escape somewhere. It needs to go through drainage pipes. So as our African population, sometimes those drainage pipes are not sitting where we want it to sit. And it makes the drainage of the fluid a little bit more difficult than what it should, and that builds up the pressure. That being said, there is genetics involved that plays a role here in Africa. Yeah. I would like to ask you, is there any association between glaucoma and diabetes? And if there is, what might be the reason that the diabetic patients are at an increased or whatever risk that places them in terms of glaucoma? Yes. One of the very good, thank you for pointing that out. One of the most severe type of glaucomas that we see is what we call a secondary cause of glaucoma and it's called new vascular glaucoma and the leading cause for this type of glaucoma is diabetes. Um, diabetes affects the blood vessels and the, the optic nerve doesn't get oxygen and the nutrients that it's supposed to get and that's why you're at a high risk if you've got diabetes. Diabetes, hypertension, but most importantly that's very something that we need to put an exclamation mark on its diabetes in the eye, you are definitely at an increased risk of developing glaucoma. Um, and that should be actually just underneath how old are you, do you have a family or relative, but are you known with any comorbidities, but especially diabetes, you should get screened at an ophthalmologist for glaucoma, 100%. Um, and this type of glaucoma is usually the one, if you leave it too long, it's developing into a painful eye and, and a rapid decrease in vision compared to your usual open angle glaucoma that, that comes with a delayed onset of damage. Hello, Dr. I'm asking this for your friend. <laughs> if the color of the eye uh, changes as um, as they age, right? Does that mean this is a symptom of glaucoma? No. Um, short one to no. Um, so there's a few misconceptions of glaucoma. It's like we mentioned earlier. It's, um, 
they need to be a decrease in vision, they need to be pain, they need to be a change in color. If you're talking about the iris color, the color part of your eye, with severe forms of glaucoma, but it's the acute forms, yes, it can change. There's blood vessels growing all over that you don't want, and that can change the color and make it a more darker appearance. But a change in color that we see usually a white in the middle, that's a cataract, for instance. Um, but short answer, no. That to make to, to help your friend is I wouldn't make them worry if you have glaucoma. That's not one of the signs or symptoms of glaucoma if you have a change in, in your iris color. Okay, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is around in terms of research systems. Are there any activities happening in terms of regenerating the damaged nerve? in terms of using technologies like stem cells or tissues or something like that. So we're living in a great era that it's coming, it's coming. But in 2024, as we're sitting here and I'm answering your question, there is nothing to reverse the damage of the optic nerve. We, we don't have anything. If the damage is, is done, it's done. We can't get it back. And that your vision field loss is permanent. But it's coming, there's research being done, especially on its stem cells, like you mentioned. There's great new devices to actively, every day, measure the intraocular pressure to help the drainage of the fluid and, and, and to decrease the fluid production every day. There's exciting things happening. We just come up from the ophthalmology congress that was happening earlier this year, and it, we are so excited for what is coming for, for 2024. There's nothing that I can give you now to, to, to reverse damage. Worldwide, not, in, not just in, in, in SA. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, mine is quite personal because I do have a parent who is who does have to call me. And um, we we just noticed that his vision just kept on deteriorating for a while. And so now they have put him on um, medication, first it was on Zalatan and now he's on Zimplenza. But my question is, are we seeing a sort of tolerance in the treatment of glaucoma? Because I think now because they've put him on two eye drops, I worry about are they going to put him on more and now are we just going to have to move on to another form of treatment or what is what what's going to happen? Yes. This is very common that that this happened in patients. Remember we are trying to decrease the progression of glaucoma and so it is progressing, we're trying to slow it down by adding in different kinds of drops with different kinds of mechanism is usual um, practice for us. Um, so sometimes a patient can have to be up to three different classes of, of eye drops as well as a systemic tablet um, to take with that. Then we can go further and do surgery or the laser therapy that we talked about. But I'm sorry to hear about this, but um, this is usually how the course of glaucoma goes. We need to pick it up very early um, to, to try and hold on with the progression, but it is slowly going to progress. Um, what I would like to mention, everybody's pressure in the eye is different. What is your limit? Yes, the normal pressure needs to be below 21 millimeters of mercury, but for my pressure can be a little bit higher and your pressure can be a little bit lower to where the damage will happen and as an ophthalmologist we need to monitor that with our special investigations, with our machines to see what is the progression looking like, doing visual field tests, is there any progression, do we need to be a little bit more um, aggressive with the treatment, adding in another drop even now or saying the drops is not really giving us what we need at the moment, we need to go to surgery. And what we need to understand is the surgery or adding in an, another drop won't improve the vision, it won't improve it. It's trying to keep what you have.
Okay, is there anyone else with a question? One last question. Oh, and Rui, okay. Yeah, a is not a comment, so it really creeps up on you. Um, it, it sometimes, Dr. was sometimes um, seen by um, an optometrist because that's, that's how mine was diagnosed. If you go for your eye test for glasses, then the optometrist picks it up and sees there's lots of pressure behind your eye. They usually refer you to an ophthalmologist. And the ophthalmologist told me an interesting thing. She says laser spray, even though it's not indicated on the list of ingredients, no, ingredients are active, I know what's, what's in the nasal spray. There is cortisone in most nasal sprays, and that cortisone also affects the doctor said that. He said that cortisone, so if you use nasal spray, especially if it's for hay fever and stuff like that, that is an insidious thing that creeps up and affects your eyes. So maybe just emphasize that part again that cortisone, which is found in most nasal sprays, do have an uh, effect on possible glaucoma. Yeah, 100%. Um, luckily enough, we don't take that nasal sprays for long periods of time. Or if you do, you do need to mention this to your, to your ophthalmologist, that you are on some form of steroid, and that puts you on, a, on an increased risk of developing glaucoma. If you're taking it orally, you need to mention that. If you're getting over the counter from another family member an eye drop, and you see the word steroid in it, it puts you in an higher bracket of of developing glaucoma, but it's very important, the nasal spray, it's not something that you think of, but you, you do need to mention that. Thank you all for the lovely talk. Uh, I have one question for you. Would astigmatism, especially if it's diagnosed at an early age, be a risk factor to develop glaucoma as you age? So for those that don't know the word astigmatism is basically, you can think of the eyeball is, it should be around your cornea, the outer part of the eye should be around like a soccer ball, but it's not. If you have astigmatism, it is now looking like a rugby ball. Um, so not as smooth on the outer surface. To answer your question, no, astigmatism is not one of the risk factors to develop glaucoma, but what I would like to mention is if you've got a thinner cornea or a thick cornea, that can influence your chances of developing glaucoma. And how would you know that? You need to go for your screening at your ophthalmologist and redo the measurement. You've got a, a very thin cornea, this puts you in this category, and this is how we're going to manage you, or just follow you up, no need to worry. But astigmatism itself is not a cause or a risk factor for glaucoma. All right, are we done with the questions? We're not, it's the right last question. <laughs> Yes, so I wanted to ask, since that um, there are people who are, if you have like diabetes, you are more prone to have it. So does it, is it possible that if I have um, glaucoma, is there any other thing that I should worry about? Maybe if I have it, besides the optic nerve being damaged and my vision, do I still have to worry about any other thing that can possibly happen to me or can lead to something else? If you are a younger patient, we would go and chase what is the cause of this glaucoma. Um, if you are an older patient and you don't fit the typical criteria that we would see as ophthalmologists, this is the typical picture that we see, this is how it looks like, and on the optic nerve, this is your pressure, your drainage angle. Other causes that you can think of is like obstructive sleep apnea. Is, is, is another risk factor for glaucoma. It's usually your more obese type of patient at night. They are prone to developing glaucoma. But I wouldn't worry if I were you and you were diagnosed with glaucoma thinking there must be something else. It is usually known, it is usually diabetes, it is usually your hypertension or somebody that's on, on the steroids, or like I mentioned previously, you had previous trauma to the eye or a severe eye infection that we call uveitis, um, an ongoing inflammation in the eye that, that you develop. Okay, 
the, the glycoma. But we would usually see on physical exam, this is not the typical eye that we see. Your anatomy looks different. We're seeing other signs that can lead us to maybe maybe we should think of this type of condition in this. But I don't want you to, to start doing what other causes do I have if I've been diagnosed with glycoma. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I like that you mentioned that, because that's quite something we do a lot. Uh, we don't go to the doctor and Google the other causes and, you know, instead of going to the actual protection practitioner. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I just want to say, before we close, that I am so, so grateful that we had this conversation, uh, because throughout the conversation, I'm, I'm very sure that you also saw that a lot of people uh, participated and showed their keen interest in knowing, and that's beautiful, honestly, because, like you said, there's not that much knowledge about it, um, and also the fact that there's progression that's being made medically. Yes, it's hard to, to see it and to spot it out, but the fact that you guys are literally working your way through it, um, it really says a lot. And also about the profession, you guys are, you know, you're adding to the profession again of medicine. Because I know we've got, med we've got medical students here. How many of you are medical students by a show of hands? What are the rest of you doing? Like, what? Okay, oh, you know what? <laughs> And everyone else, what are you guys doing? Lifelong learners. That's all of us, the rest of us. Lifelong learners. Librarians, researchers, everyone. Lifelong learners. Um, Dr. Aru, we've got a small um, thank you, thank you gift for you. If Aru can please bring it forward. I just want to say thank you for your time. Can you please give him a warm round of applause? And I also want to thank our lovely audience. You've been so amazing today. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for participating. I also want to say thank you to the UFS um, <laughs> sound and technology. Am I saying it correctly, guys? Is it sound technology? It's not sound and technology. There's a, there's a, there's, I need to find the correct, correct wording for it. Technology team. That's the word I was looking for. Yes. Thank you to our UFS technology team for joining us and making all of this possible. Um, I know that there are also our librarians here in the audience. Those are the people who help with a lot of information because we are the information services. We're in information services. Thank you um, to everyone else who is here, whether by whether you grabbed on the side of the by a friend, dragged here, or whether you responded to an email that was sent. On the topic of emails, those of you who did not get an email about the coffee talk um, and would like to be reminded on a monthly basis, please go to the front um, desk, the front as you enter the library, and leave your email address there so that I can send you monthly reminders. Because I know sometimes you tend to forget, a lot happens. But if you'd also like to remember, you can follow us on Instagram, you can also follow us on Facebook, um, it's UFS Library and Information Services on Facebook, and on Instagram we're UFS underscore library. Please follow us and engage with us, we love hearing from you. And ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, um, I'd like to close this session. Thank you so much again, Dr. Arnold. Thank you. Thank you.